<laughs> Very good. Well, let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 16. One of the most famous portions of the book of Acts is this 16th chapter and the narrative that we're going to be looking at tonight. The message is entitled Jailhouse Rock. And not, uh, not exactly what happened there that night, but, <laughs> but you get the idea. And uh, there was music going on uh, there in the jail as Paul and Silas sang at midnight, keeping everybody awake, uh, just like I suppose uh, some of that uh, rock music does for the neighbors who are holding their pillows over their heads. Anyway, Acts chapter 16. Uh, last week, you recall, we looked at the spirit of the serpent in Acts 16, verses 16 through 22. We saw that that narrative about Lydia was immediately followed by a narrative about the demon-possessed woman. And uh, as we mentioned last week, I think that is no accident in Scripture that the Holy Spirit inspired it in such a way that we can see the contrasts and the comparisons. We learned uh, 10 different principles, actually 12 different principles, uh, last week. <clears throat> First of all, we learned that don't insist that God has to do things your way. Number two, don't insist that God must always do the same thing the same way. Number three, we saw that Acts is the expanse of the gospel. That's in that entire context of Lydia and the demon-possessed woman. We see these things being brought together. Uh, Acts is the expanse of the gospel. Number four, you go where people are most likely to respond. Start where there's an opening, no matter how small it is, and we need to do that in our witnessing. Number five, don't be so stuck on your highly developed strategy that you always worked for you before that you fail to modify it to accomplish the next step in God's plan for your life. Uh, God doesn't have to do things the same way all the time. And then number seven, uh, or number six, we uh, learn don't drag your feet when God gives you a target. Start moving in that direction and God will give you light as you go along the way. Number seven, a building was not needed for corporate prayer. Number eight, prayer is essential for church growth. The three basic lessons that we learned in relation to prayer in that section, never give up in prayer. Number two, no matter who you are, your prayers are important to God. Number three, God can give you above and beyond all that you ask or think, and that certainly happened with Lydia and her little prayer group by the river. Principle number nine that we learned was be ready and available to be used by God. No matter who you are, God can use you after he gives you what is his best. God used Lydia to establish a home base for Paul's outreach. Second, that humble beginning was the start of the church at Philippi. Be ready to be used by God. You never know what he's going to do with you. That little beginning started the church of Philippi, and we have the book of Philippians as a result. Thirdly, it was a woman's prayer group where all of that got started. God can use you if you are ready and available to be used. Principle number 10 was obey first, leave the results to God. It was only women to start with, but God did raise up men in that church. So don't be discouraged with the lack of men even here. God can raise them up in his time. We need to obey first, leave the results to God. Principle number 11, we have a, a saying in English uh, that really uh, puts this together, is put your money where your mouth is. Put your money where your mouth is. Those women clearly supported Paul financially. Lydia was a businesswoman. Paul mentions their financial support in the book of Philippians. So God recorded the fact that not just Lydia uh, opened her house to him and said, well, now you guys go out and beg on the street for money, but you can stay in the basement. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, they clearly supported Paul financially. God had a reason for sending Paul to a group of women. And secondly, women clearly played a key role in the church at Philippi, which was the central hub of Macedonia. They made up that first core group. Principle 12 is expect major spiritual attack from a counterfeit that is similar to your primary support. It's a very important principle. Expect a major spiritual attack from a counterfeit that is similar to your primary support. A woman was the first major opponent of the gospel in Philippi. That demon-possessed fortune teller that we studied last week. It was between women that the first major division in the church appeared to take place there at Philippi. So um, God used the women to get it started, but Satan raised up opposition from the same source that the major support was coming from. Uh, and we looked at that passage in verses 16 through 22 last week. We learned some more important lessons from this. Number one, because of the contrast there, 
we can see that the same message can invoke a different response in different people. Lydia we responded one way, the demon-possessed woman responded in a different way to the very same message. Number two, Satan brought his attack against Paul's entourage while they were engaged in spiritual activity. They were going to prayer. They weren't engaged in some kind of carnal activity, getting drunk at the bar. Satan doesn't attack you while you're being carnal. He attacks you while you're trying to do the will of God. So expect it. If you're going to live for Christ, expect to be attacked. Most people say, I don't want to be attacked, so therefore I'm not going to live for Christ. Uh, I don't want to get into trouble, you know, with spiritual warfare, so I guess I'll just sort of live a namby-pamby, blah kind of a life. Don't do that, because you won't get heavenly rewards. God has called us to spiritual warfare. He's given us the armor that's necessary for spiritual warfare. That's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 10 through 20, where you are given the entire spiritual armor necessary for carrying forth the battle that God has put you in. We don't like it all the time, but God has made us soldiers. Whether we like it or not, you are in the battle. And it is important that we wear all the armor so that we're ready when the attack comes. Number three, Paul and his company did not just accidentally run across the woman. Uh, we noted last week that she met them. Satan's on the lookout for Christians who are involved in spiritual activity. He will boldly confront you when that is the case with the most obnoxious and distasteful things possible to try to get you sidetracked. The devil doesn't come in with everything all sweetness and light when he attacks. He's going to make it as obnoxious and as difficult for you as he possibly can. We noted the woman was persistent. As soon as her demonic radar locked onto Paul, she began to follow him screaming to all the bypassers who this guy was. She was not only persistent in following them once, she met them day after day, did the same thing over and over again. When Satan tries to track you down, he doesn't give up. It says that she tracked them many days. She told the truth. She had the correct message, very clear. The same followed Paul and us, crying and saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. That puts it in a nutshell, doesn't it? Nobody came to Christ as a result of her testimony. Satan knows that one of the most effective ways to counter the message of the truth is to be blunt by shouting it through the lips of some weirdo whose persona is already questionable, tacky, outrageous, lunatic, fringe, bizarre, weirdly dressed, obnoxious, or mentally off base. God doesn't need weird, demon-possessed people witnessing for Jesus. But Satan will be happy to do that if he knows that it can turn somebody away from the gospel. And so he will be more than happy to talk about it. Even possessed people start screaming who Jesus was in the gospel. Jesus told them to shut up and come out of the demon-possessed person. We saw that there was an illustration of that even where a demon-possessed person was in the synagogue. They will go to the religious centers. They will act pious. They will act religious. But they can still have a demon inside them. Just remember that. Key lesson, in other words, persistence, telling the truth, telling it publicly, telling it loudly, having a target audience are not guarantees that people will come to Christ or that the gospel will take effect. It's not the mechanics, folks. It takes the Spirit of God, not the tactics of the world, the flesh, and the devil. We noted that the spirit of Python there uh, is the word that's translated divination. The spirit of divination, that word is in Greek, Python. Of course, the serpent, and that is Satan himself, demonic force and we would call that in modern witchcraft she was a medium that's what the soothsaying is all about uh, we saw there's money in witchcraft she brought much money to her masters verse 16 the world's not afraid of the demonic supernatural as long as it satisfies their greed if you touch the money bag though you go to jail and that's what happened to Paul we remembered some of the demonic encounters previously in the book of Acts Acts is a book of supernatural warfare that's all the way through the book of Acts Demonically controlled people show up at critical junctures in the life of the church, just like the demon-possessed man in the synagogue. In Acts 8, we learn the key principle by looking at Stephen. He was stoned to death, and Philip, who had a great revival under his leadership. And we learn the principle from that, that when you're in leadership, expect to step up to the plate and face the battle when the man ahead of you is taken out of the game. And that's why there are elders in the church. If something happens to the pastor, the next elder steps up. If something happens to him, the next elder steps up. If something happens to him, the next elder steps up. I mean, that has happened all the way through church history. Satan always goes after leadership, tries to destroy the leadership, get rid of them if he can. So be ready when your turn comes. We saw the difference between Philip and Stephen uh, in dealing with the supernatural. We talked about the miracles that they did. 
Uh, Stephen had the gift of miracles, but he was killed. Uh, Philip performed supernatural miracles. He cast out demons. He did multiple healings, um, but he was not killed. By the way, it never says that Stephen did healings. It just says he does did miracles. And we saw the three different words uh, that are used for the supernatural uh, powers that are expressed throughout the New Testament. The word dunamis, which is the word translated power, the word wonders, which is teros, and then the word miracle semion, which is a sign, that which authenticates the message of the uh, messenger. And we noted that Satan also performs signs and wonders, and that is why you must go to the text of Scripture to determine whether or not this supernatural thing fits with the Word of God, because Satan will deceive with signs and wonders. The Antichrist, the false prophet, they will both be able to do signs and wonders. They'll be able to do miraculous things, and they will deceive the world by those things. But the test is what does the Word of God say, not whether or not this person or that person is able to do some kind of a supernatural miracle. Uh, we talked about the uh, sign gifts during the apostolic period. The purpose was to bear witness to the testimony of the apostles. And uh, we saw that Jesus specifically prophesied that at the end of the Gospel of Mark. By the way, that's a very important passage. Uh, the last uh, few verses of the Gospel of Mark, a lot of the liberals want to throw those out of the Bible. They say, oh, quote, they're not in the best manuscripts. That's not true. Uh, that's their opinion. But uh, very clear that those verses are there because part of those verses talk about what the apostles are going to do if they believe. Jesus has just finished excoriating, that is, bawling out, scolding the apostles because they have not believed. He says it three times that they had believed not uh, after he rose from the dead. And he says, these signs shall follow them that believe. That's the very next thing in the text. So the signs are not there for the charismatic movement today. Those signs were the signs that were given to the apostles when they finally believed in the resurrection of Christ because they doubted, you remember? They were scared when he showed up the first time after the resurrection. They didn't believe the women who came back from the tomb. They didn't believe believe the two who came from the road to Emmaus and then Jesus showed up. That excoriation was aimed at the apostles and when they believed they would do the signs and we see all of those signs uh, in the book of Acts except the drinking of poison that's the only one that's mentioned that is not recorded for us in the book of Acts but it must have happened at some point uh, is simply not written down for us that that would have been done. Uh, they were to authenticate the message of those who believed. Mark 16 says, when they heard that he was alive, had been seen of her, they believed not. Then we find in verse uh, 13, after he appeared to the two in the country, it says, they went and told it to the residue, neither believed they them. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat, and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. So those verses relate those who believe will then be able to do those sign miracles. He's talking to the apostles in that context. We talked about the word diverse in the Hebrews passage uh, where uh, he talks about the diverse or different kinds of miracles. Miracles were distinct from healings uh, and they are mentioned in connection with Philip. We're not told all the different kinds of miracles in the days of the apostles, but they certainly included striking people with death, for example. That's a miracle. That's not a healing. <laughs> you hit somebody with death, you have not healed them. Okay, uh, That happened with Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, we find a miracle where a man was smitten with blindness, Elymas the sorcerer. That was not a healing. That was a miracle, though. We find Paul shaking off the poisonous snake into the fire and things like that. All the way through the book of Acts you find supernatural events taking place, not all of which were healings, but many of which were miracles. The Old Testament miracles were not all healings, as they were also of many different kinds. For example, Moses' leprous hand, the rod that became a serpent, the ten plagues of Egypt, water to blood, millions of frogs, billions of lice, trillions of flies, plagues on the animals, boils on the people, hail on the crops with fire running on the ground, zillions of locusts, deadly darkness, death of the firstborn, none of those were healings, but they were all miracles. There was the parting of the Red Sea, the striking of the rock for water, these are miracles of all three types that we've talked about last week. I didn't give you those illustrations last week, but I'm, I'm hoping that you see there's a difference between miracles and healings. Some of those things are dynamic powers. Some are things that cause amazement. Some of those things are signs. They point to something else beside the miraculous event itself. And many of those, in fact, all the ones that I just listed, have nothing to do with healings. 
We find the word for healings is not used of Stephen's miracles. We're not told specifically what powers, wonders, and miracles that Stephen did, but they certainly authenticated his message, and they refuted all of his opponents. Those same three words are also used frequently in the Gospels to describe the miracles of Christ. But Jesus said that with the coming of the Holy Spirit, greater works would be done by the apostles. You remember that? Jesus said that. John chapter 5, verse 20. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. John 14, 22. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And we find even the raising of the dead in the book of Acts, with Peter and uh, others in the book of Acts. I mean, you see, Jesus did these miracles, and to authenticate the message of the apostles, he gave them the ability and the authority to do those same things. Philip also performed miracles. That was the same word for miracles done by Stephen. However, healing and casting out demons appears to be one of the key elements in Philip's miraculous gifts. Stephen's principal gift lay in the area of proclaiming the truth in such an irresistible way that his opponents couldn't stand it. Verse six of chapter uh, eight of chapter six. Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. And there arose certain of the synagogue, which are called the synagogue of the Libertines, the Cyrenians, the Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. So he did all those sign miracles, but that wasn't what convinced them. They couldn't resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. And then we closed last week by noting that the miraculous sign gifts were not for personal use and they did not protect the one who had them from harm. Stephen had those various miraculous gifts. He could do things, it doesn't mention healings, but he could do miracles, it said so. He did great wonders and miracles among the people. And um, it didn't keep him from getting hurt. The Apostle Paul had all of the miraculous gifts and all the abilities to heal. He had all of those things, but he suffered horrible abuse and eventually death by beheading. The gifts were not designed to protect the person who had them. It wasn't like superheroes that you've got in your modern films today, where they have all these really cool abilities to avoid, you know, getting killed. You know, a bullet, you know, comes speeding through there and Superman grabs it. <laughs> yeah, that's not what these things were about. They were designed to point to Christ, but it didn't keep the person who had the gifts from harm. And many in your modern charismatic movement try to bend it to make it so that you know it'll take care of you. Sort of like the Mormons in their um, holy underwear. I don't know if you're familiar with the fact, but, but the Mormons wear this special kind of underwear that has little holes sewn in it in different places, and that is supposed to protect them from harm. Uh, I mean, a faithful Mormon will wear that all the time. And even if they go into the bathtub, they will take it all off, except they'll leave one leg of it on, for example, and bathe all over, and then they will dry another part off and put it on there, and then bathe that leg. Uh, I mean, we laugh at that, but that, you know, that is not what the gifts of miracles in the New Testament were about. They didn't have supernatural protective underwear um, to keep them from harm. Now that brings us to the next miraculous event that immediately follows Paul's arrest for casting out the demons from the slave girl. And so we'll begin reading here in Acts chapter 16, verse 17. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit. He didn't talk to the girl, he talked to the Spirit. Directly addressed the Spirit. I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and he came out of her at the same hour. This is not your gift. You do not have the authority to go around casting out demons. There are a lot of people who try to do that today. They're called exorcists. I mean, they're not just among the charismatic types. They're among Roman Catholics. There are even those who are in the pagan religions uh, who are involved in, quote, casting out demons. That's not for you. Uh, Michael the Archangel, when he rebuked the devil, didn't try to rebuke him directly. He said, the Lord rebuke you when he was contending over the body of Moses. The book of Jude explains that to us. That is not your business to go around casting out devils, casting out demons. Uh, your responsibility is to live a holy life, and you don't have the apostolic gifts. But anyway, let's move back to the text here. And our master saw that their hope of gains was gone. They caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city. So they started off with a racial slur. 
And then they started off an accusation that was general in its nature. They trouble our city. Well, of course, the magistrates are in charge of the city. They're responsible for the peace of the city. And have we got some troublemakers here in town? Oh, looks like we've got some troublemakers. And then it says they teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, like casting out the demon of the girl that makes us money. <laughs> they didn't give the specific charge. Did you notice that? Now, we're going to talk a little bit later about Roman law, not this week, but January 4th is when that message is scheduled, okay? <laughs> uh, because we got all the Christmas stuff in between now and then. But we're going to talk about Roman law and what's actually going on here in this passage. We won't cover that tonight. But it says, teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive. So they are making an, a charge that these men have violated Roman law without giving them the opportunity to defend themselves. And they start by calling them Jews down at the bottom class not realizing that they're also Roman citizens, which Paul is going to appeal to later, and we'll talk about how you can use the law in your behalf when you, as a Christian, are faced with uh, legal accusations. But that's also January 4th, okay? So uh, I'm just putting your appetite. Be here January 4th if you want to learn about that. All right. Neither to observe being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates read off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. They weren't just whispering it. You know, nowadays the ACLU would probably say the prison is government property. You can't sing or pray in the prison. <laughs> well, Paul and Silas didn't care about that. They were happy. Now you say, how can they be happy? Well, maybe it was a really comfortable prison, right? They had posturepedic mattresses in there or something. I don't think so. <laughs> uh, man, it was a great dinner. The jailers served them. No, they didn't get dinner till later. They're singing before they got dinner. Okay. And they were singing for their dinner. <laughs> they didn't know dinner was coming. Uh, they had just been beaten, it says, with many stripes. That's the response of a believer who knows he is in the center of the will of God. Would that be your response? If you had been faithful in proclaiming the word of God and you got arrested and thrown into jail for it, would it be your response? And suppose in the process you had some nasty guards who beat you to a pulp before they threw you into your cell. Would you be lying there singing and praying and saying, God, I am so glad to be here because I know you're here. And I want to say this as loudly as I can because I know this jail is full of criminals and I want them to know that I love Jesus. Would that be your response? Most of us would think, man, there are a bunch of black Muslims in this jail. And there are a bunch of really hardened guys in there who don't want anything to do with Jesus. Man, I'm going to be a mouse. I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. I'm not going to let them know a thing about me. They'll see that I got beat, pretty, beat up pretty good by the guards here, so they'll think I'm one of them, and I'll just sort of act macho, you know, and mm, grunt a couple of times. <laughs> to sing? Are you kidding me? I don't want them to think that I'm in some choir somewhere. <laughs> That's the way most of us would respond, isn't it? That's not how Paul and Silas responded. They sang... And they prayed. And they were doing it in the middle of the night. I mean, you think they might have stopped by. I mean, this probably happened in the afternoon sometime because the magistrates were still sitting in the town council. and So this happened sometime in the afternoon at the latest. And here we are at least six or seven hours later, and they're still praying and singing. Do you know enough hymns to be able to sing for seven hours? <laughs> think about it. Do you have enough things on your prayer list to pray for seven hours? I mean, even if you put those two together, could you make up a full seven hours with praying and singing? And not just repeating the same verse over and over and over and over again. Jesus loves me this, I know, for the Bible tells me so. Folks, these men were filled with the Spirit of God. These men were committed to giving their lives for Jesus Christ. So if they were suffering for the sake of Jesus Christ, that made them happy because they knew they were on target. They knew they were in a spiritual warfare. Most of us don't even know the war is going on. We are so out to lunch that we don't even know that the war is going on. So they sang and prayed, and it's midnight when all this is taking place, and the prisoners heard them. 
Somebody else heard them too. We're going to find that out in just a second here. The prisoners heard them. Do you suppose that when all the chains fell off, that might be one of the reasons that the prisoners didn't run? You think about that for a second. Because none of the prisoners ran. But they had been listening to Paul and Silas singing and praying for at least seven, maybe eight, maybe nine hours. Who knows exactly what time of the afternoon this was taking place. But the magistrates were still at the town council and most of them probably went home for dinner and probably didn't come back in the evening. Would your songs and prayers be enough to turn the heart of a hardened criminal while he's sitting in jail? What do you think they were praying about? I suspect they were praying for the people at Philippi. I mean, that's where they'd been ministering. They were probably praying for all the women in the prayer group. They probably were praying also for the masters of that demon-possessed woman that they would repent and turn to Christ. They were probably praying for each and every one of the magistrates. They were probably praying for the jailer. They were probably praying for the prisoners around them. Can you imagine being in prison and some guy thrown into the cell next to you looks over and says, Hi, what's your name? My name's Bill. Dear Heavenly Father, I do pray for Bill, who's in this next cell next to me. He's had a lot of problems in his life. And you know, you go on like this, and Bill is sitting there with his mouth open. This guy didn't even know me. They were praying, and they were praying some powerful and effective prayers, because we see what happens a little bit later on in the passage here. Verse 26, And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately, this is not pop, 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 and then there's a 20-minute break, and pop, pop, there goes another door. It says, immediately, all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. It doesn't say they all just fell out of the wall, but they're still attached to the people. It says their bands were loosed. It's a supernatural earthquake, folks. It didn't just knock chains out of the holes on the wall. It took the bands off the prisoners. Not just one or two. Some sort of a fluke event where they weren't locked quite right and that extra super shaky of the earthquake you know, knock somebody's off because his hand was against the wall and went kabang and then, ooh, look at that, it fell off. Everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking me out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. In that period of time, Paul had figured out how many people there were in the prison. And it wasn't like he was on the outside cell right next to the door and he says, hey, look, don't kill yourself because after all, I've been sitting here watching and not none, nobody's come from downstairs there and run up here. It says they were thrust into the inner prison. He was at the very back of the jail, at the very bottom of the jail. How could he see if anybody had gone out? We are all here. Then he, that is the jailer, called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Something that he had heard them praying and singing made him ask that question. How else would he have known to ask that particular question? He saw there's something different about these prisoners. They got a joy that I've never seen before. They're talking about how to get to heaven in their prayers. They're praying for people to get to heaven. They're singing about getting to heaven. They're looking forward to getting to heaven. I've never had anybody in this jail who's been like that. And he wants it. If you had sung and prayed for seven hours and somebody had been listening to you at the end of that time, would they be so desirous of getting to heaven that they ask you this question? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Have you ever had anyone ask you that question? I have only a few. 
it makes me feel ashamed. People who know us and who hear us, who listen to us sing and pray and talk, ought to be asking that question of us all the time. They see something different in us. It's something that they want. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And you know verse 31, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And do not leave off the last three words of that verse. And thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Some exciting things in that verse. They spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. They didn't give him some kind of psychological platitudes. They didn't say, well, now, what you need to do, you beat us pretty bad. What you need to do is, you know, crawl on your knees to Rome and do penance there and kiss the, the Scala Sancta and especially that silver cross that's in the Scala Sancta where Jesus fell down. They've got this, you know, the, 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 the sacred staircase where Jesus, they claim, crawled up the staircase and he fell down on one of the places. And so that spot, they've got a silver cross embedded in the stones there. And if you kiss that, you get an indulgence in so many thousand years off of purgatory and all that kind of stuff. They didn't tell him to do any of that stuff. He apparently knew enough about Jesus from what they'd been singing and praying to know who Jesus was. He didn't say, who is Jesus? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. They say, who is Jesus? What's that all about? You see, you have to believe in the Christ of Scripture. It's not just a matter of repeating a name. You have to know who he is. There was something in their music and something in their prayers where the jailer identified immediately who Jesus was, upon whom he could believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house, and he took them the same hour of the night. They didn't let any time pass. They're like, you guys go back to your cell. Let me think on this for a while. And washed their stripes. Interesting. He's the one who'd put the stripes on them. You see, repentance is not merely saying you're sorry about something. Repentance is a 180 degree change of life. A turning in the opposite direction from the way that you've been going and heading the exact opposite direction. A few hours earlier, he, as probably a very sadistic and cruel jailer, he was a Roman jailer, you didn't get that job by being some kind of a, you know, pussyfooting, namby-pamby, you know, wet dish rag. You had to be a pretty tough character to run a Roman jail. He has made an about face. That's what genuine faith and genuine repentance does. It changes your life. Saying I'm sorry is not genuine repentance. Paul talks about godly sorrow which worketh repentance not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. Most people in the world when they say I'm sorry mean I'm sorry that I got caught. They don't mean I have truly repented for what I have done and I will never do it again. Roman jailer, life changed proof of his salvation was in the actions that he took after he trusted Christ. He took them the same hour of the night, he washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his straightway. He didn't put it off. He said, I've trusted Christ. I want to openly identify as a Christian. Baptism does not save you. Baptism does not sanctify you. Baptism doesn't do anything except get you wet in the temporal realm. What baptism is, is a symbol of a work that God has wrought. And that's very important for us to understand. It's an identification with the promises of God. God makes promises to adults and God makes promises to families. That's why we practice infant baptism. It doesn't save that baby. It doesn't sanctify that baby. It doesn't do anything except get the baby wet. It identifies the baby, though, with promises in the scripture. It doesn't protect them from demonic attack. It doesn't keep them from getting whooping cough. 
In fact, if you get them too wet, they might get a cold. <laughs> but uh, it identifies them with certain promises to families, and we find a family involved here that God has made. A lot we can say on that subject. We're not going to have time to do that tonight. But he was baptized, he and all his, straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them. He didn't just bring them a dirty old tray of leftovers and say, you guys can eat this in the prison now. You know, I should have served you dinner, but I failed to do it. So, you know, here are the leftovers. It says he brought them into his house. When was the last time you heard of a prison warden going down into the bowels of the prison where all the prisoners are loose by himself? If he did it in modern prisons, he probably wouldn't come out alive. And taking two of the prisoners out of prison and then bringing them back to his house and sitting them down at his dining room table. You get the picture? He brought them into his house. He set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Now, I gave you an extended uh, introduction to this, dealing with miracles. And there was a reason for that, because miracles come in all sizes and shapes. There are at least seven miracles in this passage that we've just read here in Acts. The first obvious miracle, I mentioned it as we went through it, the first obvious miracle was that the earthquake, it opened every door. It unlocked every chain. And it applied to every prisoner. That's a selective earthquake indeed, isn't it? I think there's a picture being given to us there as well. The gospel that Paul was preaching was not only designed to reach people like the jailer who were in positions of authority, it was designed to reach the prisoners too. That's why it is mentioned in the text that the prisoners heard as well. And something that they heard made them immobile even when they had the opportunity to get out. The chains of everybody. The second miracle is that not one of the prisoners or the jailer and his family were harmed or killed by falling stones. Did you notice in the text it said the very foundation of the prison was shaken? Folks, we've had some earthquakes here. We can see some cracks in the wall. You can't see it behind there, but there's a crack in the wall back there where the wall is separated out a little bit. Upstairs in the room that used to be the ladies' choir robing room, uh, if you're standing in the room looking that direction, there is a big huge crack that runs right down separating this wall from that wall over there if you go upstairs over there on the second floor in the area where you're in the hall but just before you get into the ladies robing room you will see that the floor of the second floor is separated from the wall by about an inch where it is pulled away and there's a big crack that runs up the wall if you stand outside in the parking lot you will see several places where we've had to repair cracks in the walls in the brick where the walls have separated I was here when one of those earthquakes went on I was in this building and um, you know I felt something and I heard these funny squeaking noises and I walked from here into the auditorium and the flags on the platform were going like this I thought, we're having an earthquake. <laughs> da, 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 da. You know, I ran outside the back door and people were screaming all over the neighborhood, it's an earthquake, it's an earthquake. That was like a nothing. We have something that is shaking the very foundations of the prison. Under normal circumstances, that would cause everything to fall down and everybody to get killed. Nobody got hurt. Nobody got killed. I think that's the second miracle that we see here in our text tonight. And you know, it's rather interesting because when the next day rolls around, nobody in town seems to be talking about an earthquake. It appears that the earthquake only hit the prison. When Paul and Silas later get out and go back to Lydia's house before they go on their missionary journey, there's no mention that Lydia experienced any kind of an earthquake or that there was any damage to her house. Do you think God could selectively choose a pinpoint spot to make an earthquake go? Like reach down and go <laughs> on the prison building. <laughs> Everybody else sleeps through it. But the prisoners know something went on. The jailer knows something went on. Paul knows something went on. They see the physical effects there in the prison. 
Third miracle is not one of the prisoners who were hardened criminals would who have loved to escape, not one of them tried to escape. That's a miracle, folks. I mean, to change the hearts of every prisoner so that not one tried to get out. And every one of them would have loved an opportunity for a prison break. I mean, in the midst of a chaos like that, every door open, not one of them tried to escape. That's a miracle. The fourth miracle is that the jailer responded to the message that Paul and Silas had been singing in the dark. He'd already gone to sleep, but he'd been listening to them. I'm sure he'd been listening to them up to that point. He could hear them sing. You know, they must have been singing something that communicated both to the heart and the mind of the jailer. I think it was Pope, uh, Pope Leo X who made the comment to the effect that Martin Luther had, quote, sung more people into Protestantism than he had preached into Protestantism. Luther was a musician. And as you know, uh, you're familiar with the hymn, A Mighty Fortress and a Festeberg is Our God. Never forget how powerful music is as a vessel either for carrying the truth of the gospel or for carrying a perversion of the gospel. Music must be fitting for the message. You know, when you're singing, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, you don't sing it to the tune, You Are My Sunshine. Oh, just uh, that kind of thing runs through my head every now and then. You know, it's like, where did that thought come from? You know, knock it out. A mighty fortress is our God. You don't sing that. It's not a fitting vessel for the words that it is carrying. That's why singing music by the Beatles, for example, who said, we're more popular than Jesus Christ, that's not a fitting vessel to put Christian words to it. It has to be a fitting vessel for the message. Music must be melodious to express the sweetness of the gospel. You've probably all heard some of this avant-garde kind of music. I can hardly stand it. As soon as it comes on the radio, it comes on even classical stations, you flip it off. I do, anyway. I can't stand that stuff. It's all jangly and it gets on your nerves and it's got these screechy noises in it and loud bang, bang, bang kind of sounds and these dead pauses with suddenly an explosion, you know, and then somebody kicks a bunch of cans around. <laughs> Have you ever heard any of that stuff? I mean, they call that music, okay? That's not music. It has to be melodious if it's going to express the sweetness of the gospel. It has to be harmonious. You know, music has three basic elements. It has melody, it has harmony, it has rhythm. Music has to be harmonious to express the unity of the gospel. That's where all the wor notes work together to produce this rich feeling and effect. Music must be rhythmic, but rhythm has to be subordinate to both melody and harmony. But it has to be regularly rhythmic to express the order and the structure of the gospel. I would love to preach to you all sometime. Maybe I'll get to a passage where it's talking about music, so I'll feel free to go off and do a, a big long thing about music, which is a very important thing to me. Uh, about what kind of music is appropriate in the church and what kind of music is not appropriate in the church. Much of what is going on in the modern, contemporary, so-called Christian church is not really music that glorifies God. What it is is Baal worship. It's the kind of music that was used in the worship of the pagan god Baal. And it's been brought into the church. And that's what happens when you bring in all the so many drums on the stage that they actually have to make these screens. I mean, you can look at them in the, in the different catalogs that sell music to churches. They have these big plexiglass screens and the drummer has to sit behind them. They surround the drummer because he is so loud he'll overpower everything. Folks, that is not God's way. Anyway, I'm not going to get off on music tonight, otherwise we'll never get through the message. Uh, the fifth miracle is that Paul sensed, did you pick that up? Paul sensed what the jailer was about to do. That is, the jailer's about to commit suicide without any light to see the jailer. In fact, the text clearly states that the jailer had to call for a light to check out Paul's claim that nobody had escaped. 
If the jailer couldn't see in the dark of the dungeon at night, it's reasonably certain that Paul couldn't see either. And not only that, but Paul was down in the inner prison, down at the very bottom. The jailer just got to the door and saw everything is open and he's going to commit suicide. That's a miracle that Paul knew that was what the jailer was about to do. And he called out and said, do thyself no harm, we are all here. And you know, that's a miracle in itself too. Paul, how could he have known that every prisoner was there? Like we said before, he wasn't at the top of the stairs. He was in the bottom of the prison. Nobody was running past his cell. How would he have known? That's miraculous knowledge that God gave to Paul, both about who was in the jail and what the jailer was about to do. You know, it's rather interesting. I think that's a supernatural insight that God gave to Paul for one specific reason. To stop one of God's elect from dying before he trusted in Christ. Think about that. It's only a few minutes after this that that jailer comes to faith in Christ. What if he had committed suicide first? Would he be in heaven today? He would not be in heaven today. God in his mercy gave Paul the insight to know and understand and to shout at precisely the right moment. You know, that guy, as a Roman jailer, knew that he would be tortured and put to death if even one prisoner got away. He's got his sword, because you don't run down to the jail without your sword when you see something like this taking place. He was expecting probably to face a gang of prisoners and he was going to have to fight his way getting them back down that stairs down in the dungeon. He's got his sword. He sees the doors are open. He thinks, oh man, I'm toast. He has a sword and he's about ready to fall on it when Paul cries out. That took probably less than five to ten seconds for all of that to run through his mind. But before he actually drops his body, Paul cries out to him. You think God can save somebody on their deathbed? You think God can save somebody at the last minute? That's what happened here with the jailer. And what a transformation from a man ready to commit suicide to a man filled with joy and peace and seeing his entire house saved. Oh man, this is a, it's a powerful text. The sixth miracle is that not just the jailer, but his entire household, his wife, his kids, his servants, anyone else who was living there. Because the household covered all of that, that word household. Every one of them trusted Christ that night. The seventh miracle is that the jailer brought two prisoners into his own home. I mentioned that a moment ago. That's a definite no-no under Roman law. But at this point, the jailer was more afraid of God than he was of Rome. You know, that's a good place to start. <laughs> to be more afraid of the living God than you are afraid of your government. So many of us are so afraid of the government that we don't trust God. I mean, this stuff coming over the internet all the time, all this panicky stuff coming over the internet, all about bad things that are happening and Christians pulling their hair out and, you know, weeping and sobbing and moaning and groaning. They are more afraid of the government than they are of the living God. Because if they are more afraid of the living God, they would be out there witnessing like crazy because only the gospel can stop the evil in this world. We complain, but we don't witness. We gripe and bellyache and scream and yell and tell other people how bad it is, but we don't witness. But you know, all that bellyaching and screaming and yelling and complaining will never stop the evil. Only a transformed life can do that, and that's what happened that night with that jailer. You know, we see the magistrates making a change the next day. We'll talk about that January 4th, Lord willing. I think Paul's prayers were effective, but there were some legal steps that Paul wanted to take to assure that it never happened again. We'll talk about that when we get to it. So it's a good place to start. He was more afraid of God than he was of Rome. And you know, that's what the Bible says. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning. Starting with the fear of God is the place to start. 
The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. He had just seen what Paul's God could do to his puny little jail. Just like that. Pop every door open and drop the chains off of every prisoner. If you were a jailer, would you want to be in that situation? Would you want to think to yourself, I wonder if it's going to happen next week. I wonder if I'll get the same response next week with everybody staying in the jail. Now I'm down to point two. And it's already ten after. Next, we should notice that the world will often make false accusations without offering any proof against the Christians whom they are accusing. For example, many effective pastors and evangelists, elders and deacons and other church leaders have been falsely accused of many things. That happened to Paul and Silas here. They were falsely accused. Things from embezzlement to sloth to immorality to lying to pride, all the deadly sins. We've talked about the seven deadly sins already and then many other things as well. The different motives, you recall, we did a series on that. Uh, pastors have been accused of all that. Deacons have been accused of all that. Elders have been accused of all of those things. Sometimes it's true, but you know, historically, many times it has not been true. But the devil doesn't care. The devil encourages falsehoods about church leaders. Even the hint of evil in a Christian leader's character often destroys a man because most people will immediately spread the gossip even without finding out whether or not it is true. So I'm going to give you a practical lesson here. I can have I have enough time to do this. I'm going to take four more minutes. Okay, how to handle gossip. If somebody comes to you with a juicy tidbit of gossip to tell them, to tell you, here's what you tell them. Or you ask them a question. Are you sure about this? Easy place to start, isn't it? Somebody comes with gossip to you. Hey, some of you in here have participated in gossip. I know. In the past, I've participated in gossip. I try never to do that. I try to follow this rules, these rules that I'm giving you right now. So you ask them the question, are you sure about this? If they say no, then ask them why they're passing it on and tell them to repent. Now, that's the part we don't like. No, I'm not really sure about this, but... say No, 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 stop right there. If you're not sure about it, why are you passing it on to me? You need to repent. What is repentance? Not feeling sorry that you got caught. Repentance is 100% about face. You turn around 180 degrees. You don't do it again. So you call on them to repent. If they don't repent, then you tell them that you're going to bring one of the elders to confront them as well, and then you're going to tell it to the church. In other words, what you do is you follow the procedure set out by Jesus in Matthew chapter 18. Did you know that applies to gossip? It sure does. And Jesus explains it in Matthew 18. If they say yes, yes, I'm sure of it, then you tell them this. Okay, let's both of us go together and confront the sinner with the facts that you claim to have. <laughs> does anybody like to do that? Let's go and confront the sinner. Hey, you told me this, but you're telling me behind his back. Someone, on, let's go. Grab him by the arm. Let's go and talk to the sinner. You just got the facts, so, hey, confront the sinner with the facts. How many people would go with you? Would you go with someone? I sure hope you would, because that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to confront the sinner yourself. Then if they don't hear you, you're supposed to take somebody else with you. And then if they won't hear you together, then you're supposed to tell it to the church. So you say to them, okay, let's go and we'll confront the sinner with the facts that you claim to have. If they refuse or make excuses or backpedal, tell them that now you're going to bring one of the elders to them for confrontation. Suddenly, the ball game switched. Suddenly, it's somebody else who's on the hot seat. And if there's no repentance, you tell it to the church. You know, it is amazing how many false accusations this will stop because it threatens the people who are making the false accusations. They're the ones that are getting into trouble, not the person that they're slandering. You know, Jesus' method works. It does. All we have to do is do what Jesus told us to do. And it stops that kind of stuff dead in its tracks. The magistrates at Philippi, apparently I've got one minute, discovered after the fact what had really happened with the demon-possessed woman tracking Paul and Silas every day. And that is why the next day they sent an order to let these guys out of prison. Now we'll talk about those legal implications I mentioned already 
January 4th, after all the Christmas stuff. But when a law has been broken, there are still legal remedies for Christians, and it is okay to take the legal remedies. Otherwise, I wouldn't be practicing law. I can base it upon what the scripture says. The devil will always try to make the law say something that it doesn't really say, or he'll try to make the legislators produce a law that is contrary to the scripture. Um, we'll talk about that later. The ACLU, other anti-Christian organizations, often intimidate people with claims that are not true about the law and try fanatically to drag people into court for expressing their faith in the public marketplace. That's why the many different Christian legal organizations exist to defend the rights that believers have. Uh, the same legal freedoms that the pagans have. We'll talk about that later. Too much to cover right here. Um, Sometimes we have to suffer before true justice is done. That's what happened to Paul and Silas. The jailer didn't just beat Paul and Silas a little. It says he laid many stripes on them. The very man who beat them is the very man they shared the gospel with so that he could be saved. Think about that for a second. Would that be the first guy you wanted to see get saved? Or would you say, I hope he fries. I know he's going to fall on his sword. I'm going to keep my mouth shut. Serve him right. Someday I will see him burning in hell and I'll say, Jesus, that's the guy that beat me. That's the way most of us would respond in the flesh, isn't it? That's not how Paul and Silas responded. The very man that beat them is the man they shared the gospel with so that he could be saved. Think about that for a moment in relation to Jonah. Jonah preached as he was told to do because God had slapped him around for a while in a belly full of fishy stomach acid. But he hated the thought of Nineveh repenting. Jonah was not of the same spirit that Paul and Silas had. That passage gives us a great hope for household salvation. Children are seen in their parents. We talked about the doctrine of federal headship this morning. We have covered that extensively in the past when we contrasted the Old Testament where salvation kept getting narrower and narrower with the New Testament where salvation expands in an ever-widening circle. Well, I ran one minute over. I'm sorry. I had to skip a lot of stuff. <laughs> Lord willing, we'll pick that up in January. Our gracious Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for your word and for its power, for the good news of salvation. We thank you that you are the true and living God. You are the God who cares about sinners, even people like the Roman jailer, even people like the prisoners who heard the gospel. We don't know what happened to those prisoners. Maybe someday we'll see them in heaven. It tells us that they heard Paul and Silas praying and singing. That may have been the very reason you allowed Paul and Silas to get thrown into jail. Because otherwise those guys would never have heard the gospel of Christ. Help us to realize when we go through the difficult situations of life that at that very moment may be the moment where someone's ears are most spiritually alert to the gospel of salvation. And we don't even know it. You're a God who reaches down into the dark dungeons of the lives of people in this world around us. Help us to be faithful in being filled with your Holy Spirit, singing your praises, praying in an articulate manner and with fervency and in the power of the Spirit to the glory of Jesus Christ, your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Now, if I can find my hymnal, I have chosen a hymn. Let's take our hymnals and turn to number 300.